so last time, I'll just go over what we finished up with. We were talking about add. It's easy, just we'll have a function that takes the parameters required to create a new student object. We'll create the object and put it in our array, or at least a pointer to the object in our array. And I mean, it's easy, but of course, what was the big problem with doing it this way? We might run out of room. What if I make the array size 10? I've added 10 students, or 10 pointer to students, and I try to add that 11th. Big trouble, right? So we gotta figure something out, and the easiest thing to do was this expand capacity idea, right? Well, what if we had an, a function that the class could call when it needed to, that would create a new array that was bigger than the old one, copy the things over, and like update everything required and delete the old array as a way to just eliminate the fact that the user of this course class would ever have to think about the fact that we might run out of room. Because it'll just, if it ever runs out of room, it'll just double the size of the array. That's all. So that's what expand capacity is gonna do. Why not double it, create a new array of student pointers, copy over the contents, which of course my class at location i is just going to be a pointer to a student, so we copy that over. And once we're done, we delete what my class was originally pointing to. That's all. Update my class to point to what new class is pointing to. There, we're all set. So this is what's happening. This is our current situation. It's size 5. We need to create a new one. It's going to be size 10. So there's the one of size 10. New class points to it. Copy over the contents of the original array, which are pointers to those orange people, or orange student objects, I guess. There we go. And once we're done, delete the old array and have that point there, and we're all set. So now, as far as anyone else is concerned, once this function is done, my class is pointing to an array with the same contents, but there's more room now. It's pretty handy. So all we have to do is just put that in there. If we're ever out of room, that's what if num students equals array max. So let's say I have 10 students in the array, and the maximum size of the array is 10. Do I have any room left? No. Of course not, because I would try to put that new thing in index 10. Does index 10 exist in an array of size 10? Not in zero base indexing, at least. So just expand the capacity if that ever happens. If not, just ignore that and just carry on. Any questions about that? It's complex. The first time you see it, it's going to be weird. You'll get used to it, but it's fairly complex. Any questions or anything at all? All right. So if we were to test it so far, I've created a course. Which constructor am I calling? When you look at that top line of code in the main, what constructor is that? Is it the default one? Yeah, it's, it's the one where I said, OK, I'll give it 5. And so it'll create an array with a maximum size of 5. And then how many things have I added here? 5. Add, 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 add. So right now, there should be 5 students in that class, in that course, the course class instance, right? Great. So this is, the cur this is our current situation. We have C, which is a pointer to a course. And of course, course has all this information. Default capacity is 10. Array max is 5. Num students is 5. And then we've got those 5 students. And we've got James Hughes, Bob Smith, Sally McNaught, and so on in there. So what if I want to do a two-string? Remember, we did a two-string for a student object. And what did that two-string do? Who remembers? Exactly. Now, we don't have to make it all the information that was in the object, but all we did for the student one was basically take all the attributes and put it into a string, and then toString returned the string. It didn't print it out, it returned it. Important difference. So if I have a course, what would be a reasonable toString for a course? What do you think? Let's say I've got this scenario. I'm going to give everyone 10 seconds to think about it. I've got this scenario. If I said, hey, course, give me a string, what would be reasonable? Put, put your hand out for a sec. I'll get tired. So what, what were you going to say? I was going to say last name, comma, first name, and then tab, student number. 
That, okay, but that's for a specific student. Yeah, that you iterate through all. Oh, so you're saying basically give us the student details for each student in the course. Yeah. Does that seem reasonable? I think so. That makes sense. So here's what I'm going to do. Here's my two string. I'm going to start with an empty string and I'm going to do that string building thing. Where we just keep appending strings to the end of that string. Have a look at this code. See if you can make sense of it. I know there's comments there, but see if you can make sense of this. It might seem strange at first, but then hopefully you realize this is brilliant. What a great idea. Your mind blown, eh? Yeah, I see. So what am I doing? I'm saying, okay, let's start with a string. It's empty. Then I'm going to go to the very first student we have, the pointer to that student. And then I'm going to say, okay, individual student, give me the string version of you. Then I'm going to append that string version of that zeroth student to the course string. Then go to the next student, get their string version and append, and so on. So I'm actually like cascading the two strings. Imagine I had like a university class where the university had a whole bunch of courses. What would be a reasonable two string for that university or something? Well, we could call each individual courses two string, which in turn called the individual students two strings. And it's just good design. Yes? So is that, um, is that listing like the first, for the first student, the first name, last name, email, second student, first name, last name, email? Well, let's think about it. Here's the answer to your question is, it's whatever the, the student's two string is. Because my class at location I is a pointer to a student. And when we tell a student to, to string, we'd have to go look at our code. So if we go, oh, where's my mouse? Student, they're two strings. So I guess it's first name, last name, bracket, student number, close, parentheses, email, tab, their current average. Why? Because that's what I wrote. But here's the thing. I could change this. I could change how I represent it. Maybe I want last name first. I, I change it in the student class, but the course class, it doesn't really affect how this course, like the code in the course class for their two string doesn't change at all. But because it called the student's two string, it'll change how the course's output is like formatted, which is cool. So the answer to your question is, it's whatever the two string, whatever the two string for the, very, for the specific type of object in this class, in this case it's a student, it's going to be whatever the student's two string says. If student's two string was really simple, it just said, return, I am a student. And I ran it on a course that had five students in it, what would the result be for this function? I am a student five times. I am a student, I am a student, I am a student, I am a student, I am a student. Is that five? Let's pretend it was at least. Right? That's all it would be. Why? Because that's what the two string for the student was. Not a very good one. That's what we made our own. Other questions about this? Good question. It's pretty handy. Who here sees this and goes, ah, oh, that's kind of cool, yeah, clever. Good, because it is kind of clever. So if we test it out, well, let's move that mouse, that'll be annoying. Do something like that. If I were to ask, if I run this code, what should be output in here? Is that, oh, is that what? Well, hold on, like how many students are in this course? No. no. There's none. There's zero students. So if I said, all right, empty course, what's the string version of you? What should the result be? Nothing. Nothing, exactly. Empty. A little like an empty string. Good. Very good. So now I add these uh, one, two, three, four, five things. And if I do two string, what should we see? James Hughes and Bob Smith and so on. Great. And then if I add this, so one, this will work because it will automatically update the size of the array. The, the array would then be size 10 because it would double from 5. And if I do it again, what would we see? 
Same as before, just we also have Andrew Roy, or Raw, whatever you, I don't know, however they pronounce it. They will also be included. Any questions about this two string? I see some people looking at this like, yeah, but other people have like a confused look on your face. So I want you to, if you're confused at all, please ask. Yes? Are they going to print out in that specific order of like, that's how they might end to make So they, you brought up an interesting question. So the way it's, it would come up in this specific order because James Hughes would be added to index zero. How do I know that? Well, because there was nothing in there before, and then so on. So they would come up in this specific order, but we're going to talk about something very shortly that can end up messing up the order. So I like the way you're thinking. Other questions? Yeah? Uh, is two string case sensitive? Uh, well, it's not that it's case sensitive. It's, it's I'm calling the function called two string. I could have called two string Billy Bob and just call it Billy Bob. Now, in certain programming languages, two string is a very specific, think of repr. Repr in Python, it had to be repr, right? There isn't really an equivalent of that. More on this later though, we're gonna talk about some of the pros and cons of having something like repr in Python, where you have it for free. Here you didn't get it for free, so what you call it doesn't really matter, but the convention would be like lower, like two string lowercase with the underscore. But in reality, what, it's C++, so it's convention, huh, whatever people are doing is the convention. And two, like it doesn't actually matter, it's just another function. But unlike Python, where it had to be repr, because it was special. And in Java, I think it's two uppercase string, like it's camel case two string. And in Java, that's a special one too, like kind of like Python. C++, it's not. Good question though. There was another hand I thought I saw. We're okay? Okay. So of course, we delete at the end, but more on that in a moment. So, remove. So this goes to what I was just about, kind of referring to you about. <coughs> How are we going to remove something from this? Well, there's a bunch of ways we can do it. I'm going to show you one of the literally infinite possible implementations of a way to remove something from this list. But just for fun, I'm going to make use of the student classes equals. Who, are, who remembers what it meant for two student objects to be equal? Same student number. So here's what I'm going to do. Okay, Without even looking at this code, if I say, hey, remove a given student from this, uh, this array of students, who knows the very special name of a type of algorithm we're obviously going to have to do? Because you don't know whether that student's in that array or not, right? A linear, search. a linear search. Let's start at the beginning. Are you the one I want to remove? Yes or no. Are you the one I want to remove? Yes or no. Are you the And so on, until we find it. Maybe we don't find it, then we don't have to do anything. But if they're in there, we're going to have to remove them. So how are we going to remove them? Well, let's think about this. I want to start with a dummy student object. Is this student object, is it going to be, this is going to be a variable called dummy that's a student object, not a pointer to a student object in this case. Why? Because I wrote it this way. I could have made it a point, it doesn't really matter, I just did it this way. So I've got dummy, and what's its first and last name? Nothing, empty strings. What's their email? Or I guess uh, email is empty and their average is zero, that doesn't matter. But what did I set it? Student number. So if I'm saying remove, the parameter I'm giving remove is going to be the student number. Then I will create a dummy student object with nothing in it but that student number. And now I've got an easy way to compare students. Because if I have a student and a student, and if I want to know they're equal, it just compares student numbers. Now you might, don't think for a second, oh, so when I remove something, it needs to be student number. No, I'm, I'm inventing this. I'm, re I'm writing a function to remove something from the array. I'm writing it the way I'm writing it. I could write it a bajillion different ways. That part doesn't really matter so much. And so, and the fact that, oh, why searching based on student number? Honestly, I could have searched based on first and last name, I guess. This is all design decisions I made. It doesn't really matter. How you implement it is up to you. I'm just showing you one way of achieving this basic idea. So remove, there we go, I've got this dummy one. Then, there's a lot going on here. 
but let's take our time. We see that for loop, it's just the linear search. Start at the beginning. Zero to the number of students. If I have an array of size 1,000, but there's only five students in it, how many do I actually have to look at? Array max or num students? Num students. No sense looking through empty bits. Empty. So I go through and I say, okay, if my class at location i is equal to the dummy student. Also, I think there's a typo in here. I think the way I wrote equals actually is supposed to be a pointer to a student object. So how would I fix that? Put the asterisk. No, not the asterisk. Ampersand. The ampersand in front of the dummy. Or makes the dummy an actual pointer, whatever. Let's not worry about that too much. Point is, I say, is the thing at location i, first time to the loop, is the thing at location 0 equal to the thing I want to delete? If it's not, just skip everything and go to the next index. i. Ah, i increases is the thing at location 1, the thing at location 2, and so on. We just go until we find it. So let's say we find it. That's the if statement. If it's true, we want to remove that student. That student was allocated the way I wrote it. That student was in dynamic memory. So if we're cutting that student, we're probably going to want to delete that student then, right? It was created before, and when it was created, it had a new variable. But now that I'm removing something, I better delete it here. Like, I'll, I'll delete it. This is, I'm deleting the thing now. For every new, we need to delete. If I'm removing this person, I'll delete them. So they get cut. See if I can find a good marker here. Pretty good. So let's say I've got this scenario. There. Right now, I guess max array is five, and there's three students in there. And let's say I want to remove the zero with one. Okay? Why? Because. Also note that I'm drawing the little stick figure student objects all over the place because I don't know where they are in dynamic memory. They're just who cares. We have pointers that get us there. That's all that matters. So this is our situation. I want to remove, because I found the thing I want to remove at location zero. So what do I say? Okay, I found it. The first thing I do is delete my class at location i. Well, my class at location, location 0 means delete this. So this is what happens. Now, without, don't bother looking at the code right now. This is our current situation. What's the problem? I'm getting a lot of mumbles. There, that's less mumbly, there, we got this empty space at the beginning. Of course, this was an example with three. I could have deleted this one and I'd have an empty space. If I deleted the last one, not that big of a deal, whatever, fine. But if I delete it, I've got an empty space. Now we have a question to ask. How do I address this? What should I do? I've got a couple of options. One option, perhaps the most obvious option, is we'll just shift everything down one, right? Like imagine this row is pretty full, right? I've got, there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, right? There's nine people in that row. If I told you, you don't actually have to do it. If I told you to stand up, and he's the beginning of the row. Now I've got this empty spot. If I tell everyone to shuffle down, how many people have to shuffle down? Eight. What if that row had 100 people in it? 100. What if, that, what if that row had 1,000 people in it? How many people do have to shuffle down? <coughs> 990 and so on. Whatever the number is, minus 1, right? OK, not a big deal. For those of you that remember a little bit of computational complexity, is a linear time function OK? That's fine. Like, that's pretty speedy. But here's the thing. We can do better than that. What if I tell you I, we, can, we can fill in that gap with a constant time algorithm? For those of you that don't know linear versus constant time algorithm, we're going to talk more about this a lot a little bit later in the course. But a linear time algorithm is one that, as the number of people sitting there, 
increases, the amount of work I have to do increases linearly. Basically, let's say there are n people in that row. How many people had to move? n minus 1. Let's say I double it to two n people in that row. How many people have to move? Exactly. So when I doubled the amount of n, it doubled the amount of work, basically. Right? What if I told you we can, we can solve this problem in order one time? Meaning, if I give you, if there's n people, the amount of work it requires is 1. Or if I give you 2n people, the amount of work it requires is still 1. If I give you 50 times n people, it's still going to be 1. That would be a constant time algorithm, and we like that. By the way, do note that the amount of work being done doesn't necessarily have to be 1. It's just that it, it's constant. It doesn't change. So here's what we're going to do. And we're lucky. We can get away with this, but we're going to talk about it still. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to say, OK, make the thing from the position you just deleted point to the last thing. So it doesn't point here anymore. It's going to point there. OK? Then I will decrease num students. So in this case, num students was 3. But I just deleted the 1. Now num students will be 2. Which means when I add a new one, where would it go in here? Over here. But remember, we're not overriding this. We would be overriding this, which is just the pointer. So if I had a new student, I would create the student over here, and then this would get replaced with this, and so on. Meaning, I don't really care what's in here anymore after I've reduced it. If I had a million things here, and I removed the first one, all I have to do is make the thing at location zero point to the end, and say, OK, the next decrease the num students. Which means the thing at the end, you might say, oh, but you have two things pointing to the same object. True, but as far, in all intents and purposes, this, the fact that that pointer's there doesn't matter because we know we're going to override it anyway. I know that there's only, oh, there's only two students in here. These two matter. What's ever after that, I don't care about. So it's quite clever. So now I've got a billion things. Trillion things, quadrillion things, I still only have to move one thing. But you've got a comment or so question something. So you're not shuffling everything down one? Exactly. Okay. I don't have to shuffle. But of course, is there any catch or point that we think should be brought up about what I just said? Uh, if you're not shuffling anything over then, order must not matter. Bingo. Order does not matter in this case. So this goes to what, kind of what you were asking about moments ago. You were asking, well, what order would it print it out in? Well, in the order in which things were added, however, if we start removing things, things might start moving around. So this must mean that the order of the, of the students in the class doesn't matter. If, let's say we had a course object, but the course object somehow ensured that the students would always be in alphabetical order by last name, for example. I mean, the ordering we can define as whatever we want, actually. It could be last name, first name alphabetical, student number, ordered, I don't know. Point is, the ordering of the students in the course is up to us. Right now, there's no ordering. It doesn't matter. But if there was an ordering, this would clearly mess up the ordering. So maybe that wouldn't work, if ordered matters. But it doesn't, so we get, look, way faster. If you can replace any of your algorithms with a constant time algorithm, do it. Way faster. Any questions about this remove? Yes? So, you're, so just like this right here, you're basically taking, you're deleting the pointer to the object that you deleted. I'm deleting the thing that the pointer points to. And then you're just taking that pointer and making it point to something else. Bingo. Yep, that's the, okay, you're gone, and then replace you with a pointer to this end thing. This still exists, but it doesn't matter, because we, for, oh, there's only two students in here, so only these two cells of our array are full. Anything after that, this is just gibberish. So even though it's pointing to it, it doesn't matter? It won't matter. 
It won't matter. If you want it to be super safe, what you could do is you could set this to like a null pointer. So it's like, okay, it points to nothing. Null pointer is like a special value that's like, if we have a pointer that's not pointing to anything, like I want the pointer to exist, but I don't want it to be pointing to anything, point to null. So that means like, you can check therefore easily. Is this pointer pointing to nothing? If it's not pointing to null, then it might be important whatever it's pointing to. If it's pointing to null pointer, then maybe that could be useful. More on that a little later in the course. We're going to start loving null pointer. Null pointer. PTR. Any other questions? These are great questions, by the way. Keep them up. Of course, we have to make sure we decrease the number of students. And you might ask, why am I returning true or false? Well, I guess I made a design decision where if I ask to delete something and I am if I find it and can delete it, I'll return true. If I say, hey, delete Billy Bob from the course, and there's no Billy Bob in the course, then it won't delete anything, it'll return false. Why? Eh, just so the user of the function can know, did it actually delete anything? That's eh, just a design decision. Maybe it wasn't important, but whatever. Let's test again. If you run this code, it'll work. Great. So if I run this, Two string will see James, Bob, Sally, Greg, Sarah. If I delete the 2,000, whatever that is, 200,000, two, whatever that number comes out to, 200 million. If I say delete that one, well, then we'll print it out again. But can anyone tell me what the order will be when we print it out the second time? James, Sarah, Sally, Greg. Right? Because, well, the thing at location two now pointed to the thing that was at the end, which was Sarah. So that's why, that's the perfect example of your question, of how order can get messed up. But that's okay, because order doesn't matter, I guess. Yes? So if you don't replace the last uh, one, then will it print Sarah at the second place and again? No, because we decrease the number of our students. So when I loop through, if it says there's five students, I would say James, Bob, Sally, Sarah, Greg, or Sally, Greg, Sarah. Then I delete it. Num students is now four, so I'd only ever print out the four, and I would skip that last one. Even though that that last one, that thing in that fifth location, the way we wrote it, is actually pointing to Sarah. So that would happen if we messed up and forgot to decrease. Yeah? So the last thing in the, like, so Sarah would always take the spot of whichever one got deleted? Only because in this scenario, Sarah was the last, the last one in. If I, re if I added a sixth one that was called like Billy, then it would be James, Billy, Sally, Greg, Sarah. Yep. Should you delete like the uh, pointer that you copied over? Like say if you put Sarah in like the second position, should you like delete that like it's been practice? Sarah in the second position. And what, what, what here do you want me to delete? Well, because you said, like, if, if, in this case, you're deleting uh, Bob Smith, right? Yeah, this one got deleted. Yeah, so using the, the remove, you took, like, you took the last one, which was Sarah in this case, and put it there. Right? Well, I, I, I made this a pointer pointing to that thing, yeah. Okay, but then should you, like, remove or delete, like... This one pointing to Sarah? Yeah. So here's why we don't. Because this points to Sarah. If I say delete this, this goes and deletes Sarah. But then that messes this up because it's like, well, what? So the one thing that you could do, which we haven't learned about yet, and this is what I was talking about moments ago, one thing we could do to be super, 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 super safe is to set this equal to a null pointer. So null is like a special value. Maybe it's memory address zero, right? I guess that's zero, and then it's null. Then what I could be like, okay, if you're not pointing to anything, here's my rule of my program. Everything that's pointing to something won't be pointing to memory address zero. So if I know that oh, I don't want this pointing to anything, anything anymore, I could just set it point to this. That way I can be like, hey, is this thing at location three, is it pointing to nothing? And it would be like, yeah, it's, it's null. Cool. Good question, though. So get student number, or pardon me, get number of students. This is really easy. Return on students. It was very easy. I guess I should have used the underscore convention here with these attributes, but I didn't. Whatever. Shame on me. That's an easy one. 
Clear course. Here's another really easy one. Go through each thing and delete each thing. Do, do your linear traversal, traversal through the course, the array, pointing to all the students, and delete them. So delete whatever you're pointing to, delete whatever you're pointing to, delete whatever you're pointing to. And of course, once I'm done deleting everything, what should I do? That, no, this is clear course, not delete course. But I like where you're going. We're going to come to that in a moment. That's all, yeah. Well, how many students are now left in the course? None. Why? Well, because I just, they're gone. Right? You're thinking of delete course. We'll get there. So if we test it again, here's some code that one could use to test it again. Copy constructors. So now we're going back to constructors. Copy constructors. This can trip people up. This is where the notion of deep versus shallow copies come up. If I say to you, how are we going to want to make a copy of a, of a, of a course? Well, we have to define this. This is up to us. I made the course. What do I want to do? I need to make a decision. Do I want a shallow or a deep copy? More on what that is in a moment. So I mean, here's my thing. I would add this to the header. Here's my copy constructor. So let's remember, what are the attributes? Let me see if I can find a better marker. I think I've got one in my bag. Let's say here's my course, OK? What are the attributes that the course has? Somebody just start yelling them out. First name. What? First name. That's a student. What do I mean when I say that? What, what are like the, the variables, the attributes <laughs> that belong to the course? Course number. What? Course number. Course number. No, that wasn't there. That could be there, but I don't think it was there. You have like array max numbers. Okay, array max. A, M, because I'm lazy. What else? Num students, because I'm lazy. So let's say I have like 10. Oh, there's four students in there. What else? <coughs> Default capacity. OK, yeah, sure. 10. And what's the last thing it has in there? I want, I want a more confident answer. A pointer to an array which contains pointers to students. Okay. So we've got this, and it was my class, right? MC, which is a pointer to this. Well, we've got a student here, a student here, a student here, and a student here. This is our current situation. This is an example. If I wanted to make a copy of this, great. Or make a copy. Well, I could start with this, right? Just go, num students, copy that over, and there's four. Array max, that's easy, just copy it over. Just copy, you know, copy, 10. Copy that over. I guess I didn't include it there for whatever reason. Probably because it was in the header, so it's going to have it anyways. But how do I copy this over? What happens if I write like, uh, in this case, I write my class equals obj my class? What would I copy over? Say that again. Say it louder. The pointer. The pointer. Oh. So I would be saying this. Copy this over, which is a pointer to this. Is that what I really want? Maybe. But in this scenario, this is not what I want. This is what we would call a very shallow copy. Ultimately, the problem is, after I've created this, how many student objects are there? 
Four. How many arrays are there? One. Maybe my copy was meant to copy everything over along the way, all the way down. So what do we got to do? We're going to have to make a new array of that size. By the way, listen up. This is super important. People have a hard time with this concept. And this will bite you. Create a new array of the same size and max size. Okay, great. And this points to it. Can I now then, listen up, this is the, this is the, the quiz. Can I now then iterate through this array and be like, okay, this one's array at location i is equal to this one at location i. This one at location i, this one at location, and so on. You're saying, yeah, raise your hand if you're like, yeah, we're all set. Raise your hand if you're like, no. Raise your hand if you're, you don't know. It all comes down to what do we want? If I copy over the contents of this, what am I copying? The pointer. How many arrays do I have in this scenario? Two, so that's good. But how many students are there? Still only four. Maybe I wanted a very deep copy, which meant no, no, you gotta, you gotta make copies all the way down. So we would have to do this. Create a new student object that, and this is the copy constructor. So create a new student object that's a copy of the student object at location I. And then I'm going to point at it in my new array down here at location I. So finally, what I'm saying, the way I've got it here is make a new student object that's a copy of this. So make a copy. Just trust me, this person's really happy. So this is the really happy one. And we assign the pointer. Then we make a copy of this one. This one's only like mildly happy. Copy it, so we've got another mildly happy. I can give them eyes too, I guess. This one's kind of indifferent. We make a copy of the indifferent one, ah, they end up over here. And lastly, this person's angry. And then we make a copy of the angry one, and maybe, I don't know, for whatever reason, the computer decided to put it over here and ran. And we set the pointers, of course. This is a deep copy. I showed you three different levels of depth for copies. You might not necessarily want a deep copy. This is up to you. If you're saying, how do I know when? That's a question you ask yourself. I can't tell you. It depends on what are you writing. Do I want a deep copy? Do I want a shallow copy? Do I want somewhere in between? Would I have been happy with a new array that points to the same student objects? Maybe. In this case, I didn't want that. I wanted to make an actual copy copy. So this is the deep, deep, deep copy. This is good in our scenario. Any questions about this concept? Yes. So in the for loop, are you basically just dereferencing the pointer to the original student inside of the array? Like making a new object using that information? Yeah, so I'm saying the other course, right, the one I'm making a copy of, my class, so it's class at location i, dereference, so we've got the object, and we need, it's because the copy constructors always take a reference, so we need an object there. So it's got the object, and then this goes and makes a copy of the student. So this is actually going to go run the code from the student's copy constructor. If I had a university class, and it was full of different courses, and I wanted to make a copy of the university, my university is probably going to call the course copy constructors, which are also going to cop call the student copy constructors. Oh, it's all going to cascade down, and if you did a good job programming it, it'll just take care of itself. Good design. We like it. Other questions about this? Yeah? Uh, I'm just wondering when you would ever need a shallow copy. Like, when would that be useful? Uh, there's a, I can't think of anything off the top of my head, but there's, 
literally an infinite number of examples. That I can't think of a single one right now. We'll see some examples of that in the course, actually, in the assignments. Of where you're like, I don't want a deep one. I, I'm happy with just having references to the same, or pointers to the same thing. Yeah. So if we test it, whatever, this will work. Now, of course, there's one big catch here. Is I've been deleting these things, but we never actually told, oh, this is saying, yeah, don't do this. This is the first thing I showed you. This is a very shallow copy. This still wasn't good enough. I was just copying over the pointers to the same student objects here. No new students were being created, so that's no good. So now the deconstructor. This goes to what you, were, you kind of mentioned before. Deconstructor. The deconstructor is how we define when someone comes along and writes the code I wrote over here. <coughs> these deletes. When someone writes delete that thing, the computer will learn, C++ will know how to delete a course object, an instance of a course. C++ was actually pretty happy deleting student objects because there was nothing interesting going on in there. There were just a couple of like attributes. But the course is funny because we have di dynamically allocated RAM. We've, dynamic, we've, we've put students in dynamic memory, and we've put arrays in dynamic memory. There's a lot going on there. And we have to delete these things once we're done. So even though I wrote these deletes here, which is good, this code is full of memory leaks because C++ does not know how to properly delete the course yet. We need to tell it how. And here's what it's going to be. I just said it. There we go. Yeah, here we go. So here's my deconstructor. Deconstructor is the one with the squiggly in front. Who knows what that's called? Yeah. Till, yeah. Here's what we're going to do. We're going to have a for loop that goes through all of the things in the array and deletes it. Deletes each one. Each one. We only need to go to num students because array max. Who knows how big that is? Does this code look familiar to any other function we already wrote today? Clear. It's effectively clear. But of course, once we're deleting all the students, what do we have to delete? Well, the, the, like the class, the array that holds on to that stuff. That's delete. So now we're safe. We don't need to delete the integer attributes that we set, because those, those know how to deal with itself. Only the things that were dynamically allocated, which were the students and the array, based on the way we wrote this. So we're all set. Now, if I were to run this with delete, C++ is going to be happy. There's no memory leaks anymore. We deleted it all. And of course, because this is, we could just do that if we wanted. No sense repeating code, right? This and this, effectively the same. I guess this had the extra thing of like setting the number of students to zero, which isn't necessary in our delete case, but whatever. Cool. So that's it. We're done. We made a class. We made two classes. We made a very simple one and quite a complex one. Course is a complex one, really. And you did it. Well, we did it, right? Teamwork. We can now interact with them forever. We can add more functionality if we wanted. We can do whatever we want with these things. Why are we doing this? Well, it's all about operatory to design at this stage. We don't have to do it this way. We can achieve the same stuff with a different style of programming, but now we want to emphasize objects because it gives us a chance to emphasize encapsulation and abstraction. Remember lists in Python. Remember how you can tell a list, append. Append, append, append. Did you ever have to worry about that list running out of room? No, because it just magically knew how to add things to the end. No matter what, it's great. If I take a course object, you, let's say you haven't seen the code before, but if you keep calling add, is there a limit to how much you can add? No. I mean, I suppose you're bound by the limitations of your very specific computer, right? But really, as far as I'm concerned, it's got an infinite size. Kind of like those lists, I can keep appending. But you never had to think about that in terms of a list. Now if you use course, you're never going to think about, oh, how did it know how to extend the capacity? It doesn't matter to you. It doesn't matter. This code is written. I realize we wrote the code on expanding capacity, right? But anyways. 